Tiffany, I'm bored. Oh, that's that's not my problem. No, I'm bored. Okay, it's really not my problem. I'm gonna show you my socks. <clears throat> okay. I'm out of here. Hi, it's Sunday, April 26th. It's the third week of the Easter season. Welcome to our weekly video service at Roncesvalles United Church. I have lit the candle, as I always do. We're going to have an opening prayer soon, as we often do. We're going to hear a piece of scripture read, as we always do. Anthony's going to play some music. Actually, I always like that part. We're going to do kind of the same old, same old that we always do. But that's very fitting for this week. Because this week my reflection is on a topic that touches us all, the spirituality of boredom. Let's begin by singing together a song from our Lenten journey a few weeks past, As the Sun with Longer Journey. Anthony's going to play, you're going to hear me singing, and you can join along with the words. As the Sun with Longer Journey. Let's sing together. Our opening prayer, a responsive prayer. Please read along with me. God, thank you for this new day. Open our eyes to the blessings it brings. Open our hearts to the presence of your love. Open our minds to the wisdom of your teaching. Open our hearts to a deeper relationship with you. So we may greet this new day as a new adventure with you. And together, our love will transform the world. I'm going to have Reverend Louise Mahood read our scripture passage for this week. Take it away, Louise. And then Anthony's going to play Amazing Grace. The scripture is this week. It's from the Gospel of John, verses 1 to 13. This is an abridged reading. Jesus showed himself to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. Peter said, I'm going fishing. The others said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the other side of the boat. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it all in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. May this reading bring wisdom. Amen.
At some point in our life, maybe at several points, every single one of us has said these words, I'm bored. Time is weighing heavy on my hands. I don't know what to do with myself. There's just too much time. The fact of the matter is that human beings love new experiences. We like to be engaged in things that give us a sense of new interest in life. We are what the scientists call neoliptic. So while we don't want anything too scary or too unusual, we get bored if things are the same. I have that challenge every single week when I plan a church service. How much do I keep the same so everyone feels comfortable and it feels familiar and we can really surrender ourselves to the service? And how much do we have to change or things just become boring? In our common society, boredom is something that we're supposed to push away or feel ashamed of. There's something wrong with us if we're bored. And lots of products are being sold to us these days so that we can be engaged and distracted at every single minute. God forbid we should have to sit in a car and look out the window. We should be able to watch a video or be on our iPads. I have wondered lately if the Bible has anything to say to us on the subject of being bored. I mean, Paul, in his letters, tells us that everything can be used by God for our good if we commit ourselves to seeing things through God's perspective. So I asked myself that question this past week. Is boredom a spiritual practice? Is it something that God can make use of? And in fact, the passage that Reverend Louise read to us this morning tells us both about whether or not boredom existed in biblical times and also what we can do with it. I'm going to take you over to a window, a stained glass window, to continue this. This stained glass window in our sanctuary beautifully illustrates the passage from John that we heard today. Jesus is standing in front of the ships and the sea on the seashore. There's also a really cute little starfish here to illustrate the beach. The story tells us that Jesus, after the crucifixion and resurrection, appears to the disciples at the seashore. They've been out fishing, and he tells them that because they haven't caught any fish, they should try fishing off the other side of the boat. They do so, as we heard, and suddenly their nets are full of fish. They go on to the beach, and they actually have breakfast with Jesus, making a bonfire and cooking the fish. It's the beginning of a new adventure for them, as the disciples move from following Jesus physically to being with Jesus spiritually. So what does this story have to do with boredom? Sometimes in a Bible story, you have to look at what happens before the story starts. In this case, think about what the disciples have lived through in the last few years. They left this seashore full of excitement because this man Jesus told them that they were going to be part of transforming the world, making it a better place, bringing God's message to people. For three years, they followed him from place to place, these fishermen who had probably never gone further away than a few miles from home. They met new people, they had new experiences, and they learned deep spiritual lessons. Then, in a few short weeks, it was all gone in a very dramatic story. Jesus' joyful ride into Jerusalem, then the painful crucifixion, the days of sorrow, and the miracle of the resurrection. All of this would have been exciting, some of it terrifying, but all of it an incredible adventure. And then it's over. And what we hear at the beginning of this passage of John is the disciples didn't know what to do with themselves. Time was hanging heavy on their hands. They'd had this amazing life and no new adventure was now in front of them. I think in fact they were bored. So Peter says, well, let's all go fishing. And the others say, let's all go fishing. They are bored. And into that moment, after that moment, something new begins. Now, I want to take us from the seashore to the pasture. I want to talk about the concept of wool gathering. Wool gathering is not exactly boredom, but they are very closely related. 
The word wool gathering actually comes from a word coined first in the 1500s that referred to people who gathered wool. These people would go after the sheep had been moved from pasture to pasture. They would get the gleanings of the sheep's fur and wool that had ended up on hedgerows and small plants, and they would collect it and sell it, and that was their livelihood. The term wool gathering came to mean someone who was apparently wandering aimlessly from place to place, not really doing much at all. But in fact, the people who were wool gathering were collecting something that was very precious and valuable that no one else could see. That's interesting to me, because when we think of boredom or wool gathering, we think of our minds just doing nothing. We think of those times when we just seem to zone out and nothing productive is happening and time is weighing heavy on our hands. It's sometimes an uncomfortable thought. We're used to be producing. We want to be engaged. We love to be distracted. And yet sometimes our minds are just forced into that uncomfortable place of feeling like nothing is really happening. And we call it boredom. And we try to push it away. But in fact, what our Bible story today tells us is that just like the value of that wool that was gathered, that had been neglected or not paid any attention to or valued by other people, the wool gatherers turned it into something valuable for themselves. It gave them a true livelihood. They weren't doing nothing. Maybe those periods of boredom where we just feel like we're sitting there, aimless, our minds wandering, just wool gathering, doing nothing at all. Maybe they actually serve a purpose. Maybe they give us something valuable, just like the wool that those wool gatherers collected. So it's not useless or of no use at all or value. It's actually a piece of human makeup and human life, which we try to push away as uncomfortable. But maybe boredom is something that we glean in our lives that we can turn into something rich and valuable. Let's go back to the window for a minute, shall we? Science now tells us that when our minds are distracted all of the time, when we're always engaged in cognitive, active thinking, we can become exhausted and anxious. In fact, it's now been proven that the periods that we consider boring or wool gathering are actually a necessary part of happy and healthy thinking. It's as if when we're bored, some other part of our mind comes into play, and it's a part that makes connections. It's a part that takes the information that we have stored in our mind and finds a way to use it in a new and different way, as if it's creating for us a new adventure. So when the disciples were bored, it tells us it lasted a night, but then in the morning, suddenly their minds were ready for a new adventure. It reminds me very much of the women who came to the tomb in the morning when their minds were refreshed and open, when they hadn't been spending a lot of time on heavy, active thinking, when suddenly they could be ready for new thoughts in a new way and a new adventure. So maybe boredom is given to us as a spiritual tool a time for our brain to process things in another way, our time for us to shut down this idea that we have to be active all the time, we have to be thinking and engaged and distracted all the time. Maybe instead of going down that road all the time, boredom gives us an opportunity to rest and reflect and get ready for a new adventure. We're going to go back to the Bible now. So we're back in the pasture once more and away from the seashore again. One of our most beloved passages in the Bible is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters and he restores my soul. When we think about boredom, we can see that as a beautiful statement about how passages of time when we are not active and not engaged and not productive can actually be moments of feeling as if we are in green pastures besides still waters. What is happening is happening in our spirits. 
in another part of our minds than our active brains. And God always provides us with what we need in every time. So sometimes what we need is help and guidance and a way to be productive. But sometimes, as the Bible promises and science tells us, what we need is to welcome in boredom. We don't want too much of a good thing, but we do want opportunities for our mind to work and rest in a different way. And how interesting that we're all being forced to consider that at this time. Instead of thinking it's something to be ashamed of, instead of pushing it away, instead of thinking that it's a problem that only affects people in fortunate circumstances, which is not true, in fact, I was reading recently about someone who was sitting in a bomb shelter during the Second World War, and bombs were falling on them night after night after night, and this person was bored. Instead of seeing boredom as something to escape from, maybe we can, as they say, lean into it. Let it come into our lives and remain curious about what it might be doing there. Even consider that boredom might be sent to help us. Still waters, green pastures, the disciples waking up to an opportunity for new adventure after their minds have had time to rest. Boredom may, in fact, be the new mind for the spa, the new yoga for the spirit that we need in this time. So let's consider in the week ahead the green pastures and still waters that we have pushed away from us in those uncomfortable times of boredom when boredom comes into our life in reasonable doses. Let's let it sit. Let's consider it a gift. Let's think about the disciples and how it led them to a new adventure. And let's think about maybe how boredom is getting us ready for a new day. Not Just Tourists is one of our valued partners here at Roncesvilles United Church. And while we are continuing to work with groups who are doing food collection and distribution, they're doing other important work. Thank you to Michael Schulman, who's providing our Ways We Love the World this week. Take it away, Michael. Good morning, Roncesvilles United. I hope everyone is happy and healthy, and I've got a quick update from Not Just Tourists for you. Uh, we've been delivering skids of our remaining uh, PPE supplies, masks, gowns, and gloves, as well as disinfectants, and it's gone to hospitals like Sunnybrook and St. Joe's as well as the Doctors Without Borders Homeless Initiative, the PPE Drive, and a few other smaller programs around the city. Uh, we've also been able to deliver gloves to uh, two long-term care homes in the middle of COVID outbreaks. Uh, normally, we don't deliver in Canada, but during these times, we've received permission to do so. And uh, the work we do normally cannot be done without the uh, generous support that uh, Roncesvilles United gives us and that the generous support that everyone else shows Roncesvilles United. So a huge thank you to everyone who has made this possible. Thank you for keeping Roncesvilles United Church's offering plate full during this time. If you're used to giving online and you already do so, thank you for that. If you want to give us a donation now, please send us a check, give us cash, go on Canada Helps and give online, or phone the office and we'll let you know how to sign up for PAR. We're doing important work now. We want to be here to do it after this time is over. So thank you for your support. So thank you for joining us this week at Roncesvalles United Church. I'm going to do our closing prayer and our benediction and blessing. Then we're going to sing the Mishubara for our last time. Then Anthony is going to play us out. And then Mona Webb and her family are going to say goodbye to us. Next week would normally be our animal blessing service. And it's going to be this year too. We're just doing it on video. If you'd like just to include a photo of your, one of your animals, go on our website, find our email address, and send us a photo before Wednesday. And look forward next Sunday to our animal blessing video. So let us pray. Our God, you tell us that all things that you send into our lives or allow to be there work for our good. So help us to find you working in all of our uncomfortable places, in strong emotions and in moments when nothing seems to be happening at all. Remind us that you are always present, always giving us what we need so that we can learn to live well with ourselves, with others, and with you. 
Help us to embrace all of the experience in life and help us to be ready for the next adventure that comes in your time when exactly the right time comes. Our God, we continue to say prayers for so many people this week, for everyone who is helping keep us healthy and safe and well-fed. Thank you for everyone who entertains us. Thank you for those who care for us in so many other ways. Thank you for family members who keep us alive and loved. Our God, thank you for those who are connecting with others who are also lonely. Thank you for the love that's being shared and the joy that's being given. Thank you also for the members of our Indigenous community who are suffering but who are showing us such strength. Thank you for family members who are struggling with COVID-19. We hold their names in our hearts, God, and we hope that you will give them the strength that they need. We also say a prayer of condolence to those in Nova Scotia. This is a horrible time and a challenging time for us all. For them, it is also heartbreak. Pour into each of their hearts the remembrance that you are with them and let them feel the love that the entire nation is sending to them this day and in this time. We also remember the victims of the van attack that happened two years ago this week. We are with Omar and his mother and his family as they remember their father who was killed. God, you know what to make of this time. You know what we need and you send it to us. Keep our minds and hearts open to your teaching and help us to remember that you have led us down difficult roads before and brought us into the sunshine again. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I look forward to joining with some of you today at 1 o'clock. You can find our Zoom invitation on our website. We're going to be talking about some of the themes that we discussed, or I discussed, in the morning reflection. So now, don't go out into the world. Stay home. Stay safe. And may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us each one, now and forever. Amen. Let's sing Mitzuberach together.
Roncesville, United Church, take 13. Hi, hi, it's Mona. I miss greeting all of you at Roncesville's United Church. Stay safe, stay positive. And stay united. And soon we'll all be together again.